Hoping everyone is well. Doing great. Good. Thanks for filling that moment for me because I'm not good at the pregnant pause. The Lord will accomplish his purposes, bring about his plans, and fulfill his promises in spite of deceit and even through deceitful people. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you that you are orchestrating and moving and operating in the affairs of our life, and we are grateful that we don't have to depend on ourselves, but that you guide us and lead us, as we just sang. Uh, We thank you, Lord God, that you have led us to the cross, and that because of Jesus' death and resurrection, uh, we have eternal life and the hope that comes with that. Help us, Lord God, to continue to see that as we go through any trials, tribulations, and challenges in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and say, Amen. Amen. Genesis 29, 31 to 35, which you just heard, is the beginning of the birth of the 12 tribes of Israel. We'll look back this Sunday to see how we got to these four sons by Jacob's wife Leah, and we'll look ahead next Sunday to see the jealousy and the envy and the misery that splashes out of these births. births. I will be drawing my thoughts from Genesis chapter 29, 1 through 35, which is in your bulletin, so go on and grab those, keep your hands on those. I'll be referring to verses and chapter often. Then Jacob continued on his journey, Genesis 29, 1. And as you recall from chapters 27 and 28, Jacob had conspired with his mother, Rebekah, to fool his father, Isaac, in order to steal his brother Esau's blessing, the blessing of the firstborn. And when Esau found out, he got so mad that he vowed to kill Jacob. So Jacob's mother and father scoots him off to his uncle Laban to save his life and to find a wife. And along the way, Jacob, an empty-handed fugitive from family justice, has an encounter with God. You remember the dream, the ladder, the angels going up and, and down it. And God makes this promise to Jacob to be with him, to keep him, to never leave him until he returns home to his mother. God also promises to give him a whole bunch of kids, uh, a whole bunch of land, and uh, his kids would bless a whole bunch of people. And this is an extension of, this is a continuation of, this is a reaffirmation of a promise that God had made to his father Isaac and to his grandfather Abraham. So Jacob enveloped in this promise, enveloped in this experience with God. He makes a vow that God would be his God. And he continued on his journey, basically retracing the long and arduous route that his grandfather took 125 years before. So he comes to the land of the eastern peoples, which is where we are today. And there, Genesis 29, 2, he saw a well in the open country with three flocks of sheep lying near it. The well had a large stone over it. And when all the flocks were present and accounted for, the shepherds would roll away the stone, they would water the sheep, and then they would put the stone back over the mouth of the well. And this kept debris out of the water, because like you and me, sheep do not like to chew their water. So Jacob asked the shepherds, Genesis 29, 4, my brothers, where are you from? We're from Haran, they said. He said to them, do you know Laban, Nahar's grandson? Yes, we know him, they answered. Then Jacob asked them, is he well? 
Well, yes, he is, they said. And here comes this daughter, Rachel, right now. Jacob's been guided to this well where he meets the daughter of the man he originally set out to make his home with. Can you say, so God? Can, can you say, not by chance? Not that he would acknowledge it because he doesn't, but this is proof that God is with Jacob. Well, Jacob wants a little privacy with Rachel, so he basically tells the shepherds to water their sheep and to scoop, you know, get. But they're either lazy or nosy or oblivious, so they give him some line about waiting for their sheep shepherd's union representative before they can move the rock or move the sheep or move on down the road. He's still talking to them when Rachel comes up. And when he saw her, whether out of charity or perhaps ego showing off or love at first sight, Jake rolls up his sleeves and all by himself rolls the stone away and he waters the sheep of his mother's brother. Then, Genesis twenty nine eleven, Jacob kissed Rachel and began to weep aloud. What a dichotomy. Songwriter says, sometimes I'm a strong man, sometimes I cry. But the time I saw you, I knew with you to light my nights, somehow I'd get by. The entire situation, the, the end of this long journey, this meeting and finding Rachel, awakened in him the full spectrum of emotions from steel to, to velvet, from leather to lace. He had told Rachel that he was a relative of her father and a son of Rebecca, Genesis twenty nine twelve. So he ran. So she ran and told her father. And as soon as Laban heard the news about Jacob, his sister's son, he hurried to meet him. He embraced him and kissed him and brought him to his home. And there Jacob told him all of these things. <clears throat> all of what things? Well, maybe how he deceived his brother. How he swindled his brother out of his blessing. How his brother wanted to kill him. All of the deception that went on in this family that forced him out onto the road. Maybe he told them about his encounter with God at Bethel. How his old man told him to take a wife from their relatives. All these things. And in spite of Jacob's own acts of deceit, the Lord had sent Jacob on this journey, took him to the right place, the right well, the right time, the right woman. Then Laban said to him, you are my own flesh and blood. As if to say, dude, you're a chip right off the family block. We're, we're, we're cut from the same cloth, man. We're a lot alike, my friend. No, 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 my friend, not my friend. My flesh and blood, my friend. Make yourself at home. He slaps him on the back, so gives him a hug, as if to say, you're just as deceptive as I am. The divine hand of providence is operating under the umbrella of God's promise to give Jacob children, to eventually bring Jacob back home. And Jacob hadn't even prayed about this. I mean, remember when Abraham's servant went looking for a wife for Isaac? He was praying. He bathed everything in prayer. He was praying. She's got to say this thing. She's got to do this thing. She's got to be this way. Jacob's completely devoid of any appearance of relying on God. It's like when he, he rolls the stone. I think he thinks he does this all by himself. But God is faithful even when we're not. And he's operating to fulfill the promise of children and bringing Jacob back home to his mom. In spite of himself, 
God gets Jacob to where God wants Jacob to be. There's no chance happenings, friends. No chance meetings. No chance delays. No chance losses. No chance accidents in a world governed by God. God gets you to where God wants you to be. It's called providence. Providence is how God accomplishes his will. Providence is how God uses wisdom and love to direct the affairs of the universe. God is in control of the physical world. He causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. God is in control of the affairs of nations. The heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it whichever way he pleases, like a water course. Human destiny is under the control of God. He set you apart before you were born and called you by his grace. God is in control of human success and failures. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and has exalted the humble. God is in control of the protection of his people. The psalmist says, in peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Now, if you dismiss God, or you think about God on a superficial level, it's easy to say that he doesn't exist. It's easy to say that he doesn't have all power. It's easy to say that he's a figment of my imagination. But if you entertain the thought on, on an intellectual level, just to take the other side of the argument, then you have to admit that if God is God, then God is in control and is operating in our lives, your life, my life, in a way that brings about his plans, his purposes, and his promises. And if you can't entertain that thought, then essentially you're a lost individual, both intellectually and spiritually, because you have no moorings on which to steady yourself. You have no foundation upon which to stand. You are standing on sinking sand. Am I suggesting that you can sin and God's going to bring you through whatever situation you find yourself in? In some respects, yes. But why would you? If God is going to bring you through the situation, why would you sin? So that grace might increase? Of course not. But I am suggesting that you do sin. I am suggesting that you are a sinner. And I'm suggesting that you are sinful. And in spite of that, God. God. Listen, we live in some pretty dirty water in our culture, and we're all caught up in some sort of thing, one way other or the other. You can't not get wet by the water of our sin-drenched culture. Sin of fear, hate, anxiety unbiblical thought life, unbiblical sex life, porn, drugs, alcohol, pride, thirst for popularity, love me, love me, love me, complacency in your faith, compromise in your faith. We, friends, are a self-absorbed, Self-exalting, self-glorifying, self-redeeming, it's all about me culture. And we've all got sin that we're too blind to see, friends. But knowing that God is going to pull us through, why would we willfully engage in these things? Nevertheless, 
in spite of your own actions, the Lord, your God, will bring you through. And I tell you this so that you can be encouraged and strengthened and victorious during times when trial and, and, and tribulation and temptation are particularly challenging. Even though you and I are making choices left and right, and we're responsible for those choices, and in spite of ourselves, we can be encouraged. God is going to get us to where God is wants us to be. So after Jacob had stayed with Laban for a whole month, Laban said to him, Genesis twenty nine fifteen, hey, just because we're related doesn't mean you have to work for me for free. What do you think you should be paid? Laban had a couple of daughters, Leah, the older one, and we've already met Rachel. Leah Verse 17 had weak eyes, but Rachel had a lovely figure and was beautiful. I, I don't know what weak eyes means. I don't know whether she was had a lazy eye or a crazy eye or bug eye, cross eye. I don't know whether she was nearsighted or farsighted. The point of the verse, if you look at it on the whole, is that Rachel was beautiful and Leah was not. Leah was homely. And Jacob was in love with Rachel. I mean, his old man sent him to get a wife, but he didn't give him any money. He didn't give him the dowry, the, the bride price. He didn't give him the payment to seal the deal. Jacob was broke. So he said, Genesis twenty nine eighteen, I'll work for you seven years in return for your younger daughter, Rachel. Seven years? <laughs> Listen, I'm 22 years in marriage. I, I know the challenges of marriage. I know the struggles of marriage. I know the reward of marriage. So in retrospect, it's easy for me to say that I would work seven years for my wife. But going in? Hey. I, I, of course, baby. Of course I would. I don't know. <laughs> Laban, he serves up this dispassionate, it's better that I give her to you than some other man. He doesn't say yes. He doesn't say no. They use not pencil, nor paper, nor quill, nor parchment. They don't even shake hands. You know what I think? I think Jacob heard what he wanted to hear. So Jacob works for seven years. And they go by lickety split. I mean, like that, because he was, well, so in love. But wait a minute. Does that sound right to you? Me and Lori were, married, were engaged for three and a half months before we got married. And honestly, it seemed like three and a half years. I mean, time dragged on and on. And I felt like a prisoner marking the days on the calendar, waiting for this time to come. And no matter, no matter how long I waited, if I went to my father-in-law, Richard B. Tyler, like Jacob went to Laban and said, give me my wife. My time is completed and I want to make love to her. Richard B. Tyler would dot my eye. <laughs> anyway, Laban throws a feast. And when evening came, he switched out the beautiful Rachel for the lazy-eyed Leah. And Jacob, drunk, in the dark, no electricity, unable to tell who's behind the customary bridal veil, consummates a marriage with Leah. And Laban magnanimously gives his servant Silpa, Zilpa as a dowry to his daughter as an attendant. When the morning light came streaming in, Jacob discovered the bait and switch. And he says to Laban, what is this you have done to me? Genesis 29, 25. I served you for Rachel, didn't I? Why have you deceived me? 
in Laban's answer, friends, had to give Jacob flashbacks of stealing his older brother's blessing. Hey, it's not our custom around here to give the younger daughter in marriage before the older one. Younger before old. I mean, Jacob's head is bouncing off inside his head. Jacob, the deceiver, has been deceived. Rachel was clickbait. Jacob got rickrolled. <laughs> and what a way to learn to respect the rights of the firstborn. He didn't even put up a fight when Laban said, finish this daughter's bridal week, and then we'll give you the younger one also in turn for another seven years of work. And Jacob did so. And then Laban gave him his daughter Rachel to be his wife. Laban gave his servant Bilhah to his daughter Rachel as her attendant. And Jacob made love to Rachel also. And his love for Rachel was greater than his love for Leah. And he worked for Laban another seven years. Ladies, don't let your husband persuade you to get another wife. <clears throat> this deceit. This deceit is going to lead to an Olympic-sized childbearing competition. in God, of which there is no mention by either Laban or Jacob, is standing in the shadow of providence, fulfilling his plan and his purpose and his promise to the nation of Israel through Abraham, through Isaac, and now through Jacob. In spite of Laban's deception against him, God is going to give Jacob what he promised to give to Jacob. And if you read this as Israel, you can see that in spite of human deception, in spite of, of human scheming, in spite of broken human promises, the sovereign Lord fulfills his promises. The greatest deception ever perpetrated on me it was by a girlfriend who confessed that throughout the length of our relationship, she sold herself for $50 a pop to her previous boyfriends. That's plural. That kind of pain can change the trajectory of your life in every relationship after. But as painful as that was, friends, it funneled my life in the direction of the gospel. And soon thereafter, I entrusted my life to Jesus Christ. God always had that plan, that purpose, that promise for me. For he chose me in him before the creation of the world. Maybe something like that's happened to you. Money scam. That's by a friend, abuse, by a relative, as painful as it might be, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are not going to miss a thing that God has for you. You are not going to miss a thing. God is going to give you all that he has planned, all that he has purposed, and all that he has promised to give you. If you're not a believer, that's a whole different kind of deception. Humanity has the habit of using increased knowledge in order to develop more sophisticated ways to deceive. There's a pandemic of deception running through our society. And you can observe this. You can know this by observing that about one half the people believe one thing and the other half believes something that's completely opposite. And not only are they both accusing the other of lying, they both want to annihilate each other. If half the people believe that abortion is a choice and half are pro-life, then it's safe to say that somebody's deceived. 
Because these are diametrically opposed ideas that cannot coexist. And if not deceived about the issue itself, then about the idea that it's okay to shout someone down, it's okay to bring harm to someone over these issues. Same with equity, inequality, fossil fuels, climate change, gender, biology, guns, gun control, border security, immigration. One of us is deceived. All of us are angry and none of us really want to talk to each other about it. And there's not a person, probably not a person within earshot, who completely trusts what they're hearing, what they're seeing, and perhaps even what they're saying. That's because we've all been deceived. Our politicians lie to us, social media lies to us, advertisers lie to us, culture lies to us. Furthermore, we know that they're lying to us. We just don't know which lies are true. And this has a reverberating effect on how we approach life, and it challenges our trust in God and His promises. The lesson for today is even though deception runs deep in our culture, deep in our community, deep in the minds of our companions, God continues to fulfill his plans, his purpose, and his promises. Don't forget, God will bring about his promises even through a deception. The Bible says God, in an end times judgment, will send a powerful delusion so people will believe the lie. You think that can't happen to you? Jesus said, for false messiahs and false prophets will appear and perform great signs and wonder and deceive, if possible, even the elect. Even the people of God can be deceived if not for God's providential protection. When Satan gets to working really good in a culture like he is in ours, people who've refused the truth for so long become deceived. Like Jacob, they hear what they want to hear. God causes them to believe what's false, a, a strong delusion. He doesn't deceive people, no. He just gives them what they really want. But in spite of others and the deceptions they might perpetrate upon you, God is going to give us what he promises to give us. <clears throat> Do you know what the biggest deception is? The biggest deception is there is no God. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. And people are walking around all over the place acting like this is true, like there is no God. The Bible says the devil will blind the eyes of unbelievers, largely because they want to be blind. Listen, if you want to see, if you look beneath the surface and judge correctly, if you consider God on more than a superficial level, if you see your sin, and your need for a savior, then you need to run like God is pulling you to Jesus Christ who died on the cross for your sin and was raised for your victory. The Bible says I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but God lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's where vision is. That's where you can see. That's where you can avoid delusion. That's where you can be saved from God's judgment. So.
So we've gone full circle. Genesis 29, 31 to 35. We read it already. We'll look at it closer next week. It may have seemed like the Lord was absent, but in reality, he's worked through Laban's deception to begin to fulfill the promise of giving Jacob a multitude of offspring. Listen, without Leah, no Reuben, no Simeon, no Levi, no Judah, no Moses either, because Moses came from Levi, no David, because David came from Judah. And Leah names the first three of her children with reference to the Lord. God sees, God hears, God's grace. In the fourth Judah, I praise God. All through this, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob was there all along bringing about his plan and his purposes and his promises in spite of deceit and through deceitful people. Be encouraged by that for your life under God's guard. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for your precious word. We ask, Lord God, that you will continue to help us to see and to be strong in trial, tribulation, and challenge so that we might stand firm in the hope of what's ahead for us because you are bringing about your promises. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray and say, amen.